Good afternoon. Welcome to UMED TV. My name is Kamal Erkan. I'm the chairman of United Medical ACO. Uh, this is our weekly event, uh, as many of you are already familiar with the format. Uh, the only thing is that we've made some changes. Uh, so our Wednesday wellness webinar is now going to be part of our clinical presentation on Fridays. And we are going to keep it in the same schedule. Uh, second Friday of the month, we will be... Uh, we will be with the uh, diabetes uh, presentations. And after that, uh, once we finish that part today, we are gonna, uh, Sean uh, is gonna join me and then uh, we'll go through the healthcare updates, healthcare news updates, global events, and also the US economy. Uh, today, uh, because of our clinical presentation, uh, other than our team, uh, our primary care phys uh, physician, also the medical director of our United Medical ACO, Dr. Carlo Valencia, is going to be with us. Uh, Dr. Valencia, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Nice to be back. Good to have you back. And then uh, Caroline is our uh, dietitian uh, and program manager uh, for the accreditation. And also Donna Gankul, uh, who's our clinical uh, integration uh, director of uh, clinical integration. And how are you guys doing? Good. Uh, on the other side, I'm trying to send text messages. Yes. Yes. I did re <coughs> receive the one. Huh? <laughs> All right. So as I was getting messages, so then they said they didn't get, they didn't get the link. Uh, all right. So we are going to go ahead and start the presentation. Dr. Valencia, I'll do my best to keep uh, you on the PowerPoint right on time so you don't have to say next slide, hopefully. Let's, sure. let's try. Are you guys able to see the screen? Mm -hmm. All right. So, so we're we're yeah we're pretty much uh, we're going to discuss about um, you know managing diabetes during sick days, which you know will include how to prepare for it, and then eventually you know, we're going to talk about uh, some of the indications for for going to the hospital. So you know with with diabetes, it can be particularly difficult to control the uh, the sugar uh, basically because of two reasons. Uh, one is when you're sick, sometimes you get uh, you have decreased oral intake and uh, it can potentially cause hypoglycemia. On the other hand, um, um, illnesses such as colds or flu can actually increase your stress hormones and in turn can increase your your blood glucose levels. So what exactly is hypoglycemia? So I think we had a, a separate webinar um, I believe a couple of years ago, uh, but it's, uh, what is it ex exactly? So hypoglycemia is a condition when, when the blood sugar level becomes dangerously low, uh, usually when, when the sugar is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And some of the symptoms include um, sweating, Shaking, chills, uh, being lightheadedness, weakness, uh, sometimes palpitations, blurry vision. In some patients, you, they may complain of uh, feeling of tingling sensation of the lips, tongue, and, and the cheeks. <clears throat> On the other end of the spectrum, when your sugar is, is high, uh, you can develop a condition called uh, diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. So this usually occurs when the body becomes um, or they don't have enough insulin to, uh, uh, to cope up with the high glucose levels. So they end up um, breaking up uh, some other sources of, of, of sugar, which includes uh, fats. And one of, the, uh, one of the byproducts of these breakdown is ketones, which, which, can, be, um, which can be detrimental for your body. Some of, some of the signs and symptoms of, of DKA may include high glucose levels, as I've mentioned, 
high ketones, increased thirst, uh, dry mouth. Uh, frequent urination, nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, and uh, some patients may complain of having a fruity odor or, or of breath. Um, most of these patients, uh, you know, they end up uh, getting admitted in the hospital because they can be very fatal. Uh, in some cases, uh, it can lead to death if you don't, uh, if you're not able to cope up with the uh, the demands of the uh, uh, of the disease. So most of the time, they 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 get admitted in a step down unit, which is like a one level uh, down below uh, ICU. <clears throat> So management of, of diabetes, uh, I think usually starts with uh, preparing for it. Um, I think um, Caroline will touch base with how to come up with the sick day kit, but essentially you have to make sure you have, you know, enough uh, uh, diabetes medications, you know, enough food that's a very uh, easy source of, of carbohydrates, and this may include Sports drinks, canned soup, um, gelatin crackers, um, instant pudding. And then obviously you have to make sure you have, you know, the glucometer uh, to, can, to, control, to monitor your blood glucose levels. And some patients may also use a ketone meter, um, especially if they're having, you know, some of the signs and symptoms of DKA, you can use a ketone meter to, uh, to check your ketone levels. So how, how to manage sick days? So essentially, fluids is a is a is a is a big thing. So we have to drink lots of fluids, about four to six ounces every thirty minutes. You know, for those patients who are not able to to keep anything down, uh, a few sips every fifteen minutes would 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 suffice as well. And aside from 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 fluids, you also have to keep up with the the carbohydrates. Um, especially if you're not able to keep anything down. Um, also important to note that uh, we usually recommend patients to take in their, their regular diabetes medications unless otherwise directed by their physician. So there might be some patients who we have to adjust the, some of the medications. It's really a case-to-case -case basis, but for most part, we usually recommend them to take their, their medications, their regular medications consistently. And then obviously you have to uh, keep an eye on your sugar uh, at least every two to four hours. Um, um, for those patients with with hypoglycemic uh, symptoms, uh, there is a fifteen fifteen rule, which I think we may have discussed previously. So essentially, what what uh, this means is if you have signs and symptoms of uh, hypoglycemia, um, you can take in uh, fifteen grams of carbs, and then you have to wait for fifteen minutes. Check your Sugar levels again. If they're still low, then you have to repeat the uh, the whole process again until you get your sugar above uh, seventy milligrams per deciliter. <clears throat> so again, the part of the managing sick days would be again keeping an eye on the uh, the ketone levels, uh, temperature, because sometimes when you have persistent uh, fever, there might be something going on. So we have to keep an eye on that one. Uh, checking weight daily is also important because you know when you're losing weight, that means uh, you're not absorbing sugar. Um, and this is a good uh, good acronym to remember. So sick, so S for for sugar. Again, I mentioned earlier checking your sugar every couple of hours. Um, I for insulin. So if you're uh, somebody who's taking insulin, uh, we usually recommend them to take in their their at least their basal insulin. Uh, carbs, uh, C for carbs, and then uh, you have to uh, make sure you drink lots of fluids and carbs. And again, like I mentioned earlier, the ketones, if you're having symptoms of DKA or the uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, you can use a ketone meter to check your ketones as well. So in some cases, uh, if, if patients are, are really sick, uh, they may need to go to the hospital. Some of the, So some of the uh, possible indications for, for going to the hospital uh, would include the following. So difficulty breathing, um, you know, ketone levels, if they're significantly high, um, coupled with some of the, uh, uh, the, the other symptoms, then you definitely have to consider going to the ER. Um, 
And then intractable vomiting or for those patients who are unable to keep anything down, especially if it's been going on for about 24 hours, then we usually recommend them to, to go to the hospital at least to, you know, to get some fluids. Um, and then obviously if your sugar is persistently low, like less than 16 milligrams per deciliter, then uh, we sometimes advise patients to go to the ER. Um, uh, persistent vomiting, like I mentioned, and then severe diarrhea, especially for for a long period of time, more than six hours can can increase your risk of having dehydration. So for these types of symptoms, they, they we do recommend patients to go to the ER. Uh, and then again, increased sleepiness and then persistent fever. Um, uh, they, you may want to consider sending the patients to the hospital. <clears throat> And I think Caroline will will touch base or will actually discuss about uh, what to put in the sick day kit. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we never know when we're going to get sick and we want to be prepared for it because it could hit anytime. Sometimes we can prepare for it if people around us have been sick, but it's good to have things on hand. So we're going to talk about how to create our sick kit, what to put in it, um, and even some kind of nutrient values to pay attention to with certain types of sickness. Um, so our sick day kit, you kind of want to have either a basket or a box that you can put, um, really shelf stable things in. So like a soda, we like regular soda and a diet soda, um, or diet juice, regular juice, just because you want something to help treat that hypoglycemia. You want something to bring up your sugar pretty quickly, but you also want something to drink throughout the day because sometimes you really want to keep your sugar in a stable level. So we want both sugar filled beverages and your regular non sugar filled beverages too. Um, also some things like some jello soup, that's ready to go crackers, applesauce, things that really settle in the stomach well, but can be stored, um, for a pretty decent amount of time. Um, in this picture, you'll also see that there's like a glucerna. So that is great to have like a protein shake that's shelf stable. So if you really can't either get up and prepare something, you just can't hold things down. Um, it's really nice to be able to have that quick uh, nutrients for you. So you can keep that on hand as well, but you also, Dr. Valencia mentioned keeping medical supplies. So having some um, diabetes medication, even like a week's worth stored up in your sick kit, ready to go, um, having glucose tabs or gel, um, even having over-the-counter medicine, because sometimes when you're sick, you just need it really fast. Um, so keeping that in mind when you're building your sick kit. We'll talk a little bit about um, kind of guidelines. So on the next slide, um, there is some guidelines on, oh, can you go back one more slide? Sorry. Perfect. Um, so drinking plenty of fluids, Dr. Valencia mentioned kind of how much to drink, how often we want to keep going for, um, having clear liquids kind of flushing through your system at all times to stay well hydrated because your nutrient needs really go up when you're sick. Um, small portions, especially of the sugar filled beverages. So we want to make sure even if you are drinking a regular soda, if you can't get in, um, regular food to get your sugars up that you do it in small amounts, like four ounces at a time at most, yeah. just because we don't want you to have, um, a hyperglycemic episode where your blood sugar is shooting up. So if you can't eat meals, sticking to things that are really easily digested, like unsweetened applesauce, half a cup of fruit juice, basically, we just want to try to keep your sugars as stable as possible. Um, small sips of clear fluids, sports drinks, teas, and broths, if you're vomiting, um, and one to two tablespoons every 30 minutes, kind of going with the flow as much as you can tolerate, but not too much staying away from the fizzy stuff. Um, and as, as always, you could always contact your healthcare provider or your dietitian if you really need <clears throat> extra guidance on what specific foods to eat during that time. But even so, so there's specific, um, all different kinds of sicknesses, but especially with COVID-19, there are specific nutrition guidelines for COVID-19. So especially because it affects everyone differently, we want to make sure that you're meeting those needs just so we can kind of speed up the recovery process. Um, so for fluids, it's actually about three liters of fluid is recommended per day. Um, there's been some really good research out there that good fluid and nutrition during COVID-19 recovery actually speeds up your recovery. So three liters of fluid per day, that could be clear. That could be, you know, you're drinking a protein shake that still adds to that fluid intake. Um, about 2000 to 2,500 calories, depending on the patient, 
um, especially with a fever. When you have a fever, your nutrition needs are elevated because you're trying to fight off something. So you want to make sure that you're getting a good nutrient packed diet if you can. Um, and then protein as well. It's usually a little elevated at 75 to hundred grams per day. So picking protein filled drinks, protein filled, um, snacks, really, if you're not feeling hungry during the day, those small frequent snacks are going to be really great for meeting your nutrition needs when you don't feel intake a lot, uh, maybe like six small snacks a day, two to three hours, having something, even just nibbling on something. If you're not feeling hungry enough for that. Um, so eat small amounts frequently keeping an eye on the timing of things and just prioritize those fluids. Um, and on the next slide, we actually have some examples of some carbohydrates. What do they look like? If we need to get, you know, 50 grams every three to four hours, if we can't keep food down or we're not hungry, what are we going to choose? Um, so these are just some examples of 15 carbohydrate, uh, 15 gram carbohydrate choices. So um, for every three to four hours, maybe doing some combinations of these easily settable ones in your stomach. So saltines for 15 grams, maybe add a jello for 15 grams. And then you can even add some Gatorade on top of that. Um, about a cup of that would be 15 grams. So you're close to that 45, 50 range. So we have a couple choices if you're getting that 50 gram um, every three to four hours to maintain your blood sugar. Vice versa, if you're doing um, 15 grams for that 15, 15 rule, if your blood sugar is really low, these are some really quick grab, simple carbohydrates. Um, Cause we want something super easily digestible, very quickly digestible. So your blood sugar comes up, but we want to make sure we don't go over 15 grams. If we go, you know, 45 grams, when we have a low blood sugar, that could cause a, bl a blood sugar spike. So we don't want you to go mm -hmm. from low to high really fast. Cause that's pretty stressful on your body as well. So sticking to a, a four ounce cup of juice, four ounce cup of regular soda, um, keeping those on hand. Those are your quick grabs. Even glucose tabs uh, have those always available in your sick kit, um, just so we can take care of that if needed. So, um, I always love to include recipes cause we're big foodies over here, but since we kind of stress that nutrient density while you're sick, um, this is a great recipe. If you want something light on your stomach, because you can customize it based on your preference and based on your mood, but this has got a really rich source of uh, whole grains, vitamins, minerals. Um, it's pretty gentle depending on, you know, flavorings you add, if you add, you know, peanut butter or, or you could add chia seeds, you could really make it whatever you want, but it's a really great form of carbohydrate because it's long lasting and it's not going to spike your blood sugar as fast. So this is something you would eat in that three to four hour period, not something you would eat quickly to kind of raise your blood sugar. It's more of a sustainable breakdown. Um, so for example, your half a cup of rolled oats is 27 grams. If you add a half a cup of milk, that's about 32 grams of carb, 15 grams of fruit, um, which is about a half a cup, um, would get you about 47, 50 grams total. So that would be a really sustainable option for you to have while you're recovering from being sick. You could even throw in some like Greek yogurt on that, or some regular yogurt, just to add some probiotics. If you're still trying to just heal your gut from being sick. So this is a good recovery food too, if you're just trying to get over being sick. Um, so, gentlemen, I thought we agreed on the yogurt issue did without. Oh, the Turkish yogurt. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. whatever yogurt you prefer, they all have good sources of probiotics. But the best one is the Turkish one, right? I I will agree with you on that one. <laughs> um, and then we have a fan favorite. We have chicken noodle soup, um, a homemade variety, but any variety is really fine. But um, just for a reference, like a cup of noodles is about 40 grams of carbohydrate. So that's a really good source to be able to have as a sustainable option, sustainable breakdown, add some veggies. This is really gentle if you want to do a little less, a little more. Um, and you can control the spices. So I know when I have the cold, I want to have like cayenne pepper in there to kind of open up my nasal passages. You probably don't want that if you have some kind of stomach issue going on. So you can customize it. Um, but it's also very freezer compatible. So this is great for being prepared to basically kind of wrap up what we're talking about today. It's, we want to be prepared um, because we never know when sickness is going to hit or where it's going to hit. So I know I don't want to prepare food when I'm sick. So making choices that kind of benefit me are difficult. So whether you keep, you know, protein shakes on hand or snacks on hand or have soup in the freezer for a quick microwavable meal, um, you can be prepared to kind of enter into any kind of sickness that comes your way. And as always kind of reach out to your healthcare provider, your dietitian, if you have any of those questions or concerns. No, really question on this one, like, is it the same to get the ch uh, chicken noodles from the Chinese takeout? 
<laughs> I actually, you know, I don't know. Cause sodium is usually, if you're watching your sodium, of course, if you're watching your sodium, pay attention, like can suits higher, takeout suits, probably a little higher. Um, if, I mean, if you're not intaking a lot of sodium in your day, like say you're not eating anything and this is the only thing you're drinking and eating, you know, it's probably fine. Um, but if you're on a sodium restriction, I definitely consider trying to make it at home, prepare it ahead of time or looking for a low sodium option. I think some of the canned soup have like low sodium uh, alternatives, I think. Yeah, I think Progresso has some good ones. Even Campbell's yeah. has come out with some. Yeah, because I, I, I do keep a couple of cans myself at home because, you know, Again, you like know. you said, you never know. Yeah, correct. <laughs> awesome. I think that was our last slide, right? Mm -hmm. So now, uh, well, thank you both. Um, we have some questions, I believe. So uh, in the beginning, I was, I meant to actually say uh, right now, uh, as of 2022 numbers, based on the 2022 numbers, about 14% of the uh, adult population is uh, diagnosed with diabetes and 35% of the adult population over 65 years is dealing with diabetes. So these numbers are uh, extremely uh, high. I think this is probably the number one or number two uh, uh, in terms of the chronic illnesses uh, ranking. Now, uh, Dr. Lancia, one of the issues we are discussing here, if the patient knows that they have diabetes and how they're recovering or how they're recovering, uh, yeah, recovering from sick days. But uh, one of the issues that we know that many patients, they don't actually get uh, diagnosed and they don't even know that they have diabetes, mm. right? Okay. So um, uh, just to kind of maybe address that issue, what would be the best way, uh, best mechanism for patients to, for people to get uh, get to know where they are in terms of diabetes. How should they be diagnosed and what's the best way to do that? Uh, again, you have to keep an eye on the, uh, the symptoms, uh, you know, fatigue, going to the bathroom more frequently, increased thirst, because again, when you have uncontrolled diabetes, you're not absorbing sugar and uh, the sugar goes elsewhere. And then one of the things that the places that they go to is the, uh, the kidney tubules. Um, so again, frequent urination, increased thirst, fatigue, weight loss, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so if, if they're having some of those symptoms, uh, we would definitely recommend you know, seeking uh, a consultation with their primary care physician so they can be tested as soon as possible. And you know, most of the time we do have like a uh, finger stick uh, here in the office, so we can definitely do that. Uh, we do have an A1C as well, so we can definitely check that as well in the office. So, but yeah, if, you, if you're having some of those symptoms, then we do recommend patients to uh, seek medical help as well as and use for their annual physical um, uh, part of the annual physical having the blood work probably is also one of the best way right so correct in the in the bariatric program uh, like, as you know like we run two different case conferences we find out a lot of patients who don't even know uh, that they have diabetes because they're like their A1C is 9 10 11 we have seen someone last week with 14. It doesn't happen, that, but I still see, but that patient is not in uh, under any treatment, which is kind of scary. Um, so this makes the prevention the main um, kind of focus. So we want to make sure that our patients do uh, follow the primary care instructions, get their annual physical, get their blood work done in a timely manner so that we would be able to um, uh, diagnose those um, a lot earlier than um, uh, if it's going to become like more complex and more complicated later on, if it's not treated. So, uh, because this is a disease where it, we may not be able to cure this disease, but we are able to control it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's pretty straightforward. So hopefully uh, patients are understanding the difference uh, between prevention and not following through the doctor's right. order. Right. Even for those patients with like, uh, controlled diabetes, you know, we usually recommend them to follow up regularly because I've I've seen lots of patients uh, where I see them one time where their A1C is like less than seven. Then when I see them back after more than six months, sometimes they would end up in a hospital. Uh, I would see them for a hospital file visit with, with an A1C of 10, 11, or 12. So it, it does happen. So we usually recommend them to, to follow up regularly and get, get some blood work uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> 
So just, Donna, did you have any questions? Um, not really a question, but uh, more of a comment. Uh, so Caroline is one of, will be as of next week, four dietitians that we have in our diabetes and nutrition program. So one of the things I just wanted to mention is, um, as Kamal said, getting your blood work done. So even if you're not a diabetic, you're not, not diagnosed yet, but maybe you fall within the pre-diabetes range. One of the things that we also promote within our network is having um, the patient see one of our dietitians because then they can help prevent them from becoming diabetic, right? Maybe with um, looking at their current food intake, uh, you know, suggesting some modifications to their diet, uh, talking to them about exercise and some other things. So that's one of the goal too, right, is prevention. Um, and again, getting that lab work done so you know where you are and, and we can help you sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Unfortunately, the utilization of nutritionist dietitians uh, is still one of the low uh, resource that I see. Um, although uh, I think we are, uh, we are advanced in terms of our program itself, but I know many other primary care offices, they don't have these resources. So, um, and we want to maximize the uh, benefit uh, for uh, having our dietitians and nutritionists on board with us. So, um, well, just we try to cover the uh, sick days management for patients with diabetes. Um, uh, Dr. Valencia, thank you so much for joining us. I know you are in the middle of your office hours. And wow. as I was saying earlier, you are my favorite, most favorite <laughs> ECP. So now we'll know if the others are watching or not. So, uh, but you are also my PCP, like personal PCP. So uh, thank you for taking care of me as well. Uh, I'll try to be a better patient next year. You're not doing too bad, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. And Caroline, thank you. And Donna, thank you as well. So, um, we'll continue with our, um, uh, our global events and the um, U.S. economy uh, news. Uh, and we'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. So, Um, Donovan, how are you doing, sir? I am doing well. How are you? Good. Good to hear. So, um, you know, the diabetes event now is going to be part of the Friday clinical presentation. Yep. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, better in terms of what we were already doing, and some of them we were kind of duplicating. There, there was some redundancy, and with the time and getting it out there, I think Fridays are going to work better. Right. Um, but we do have uh, other issues that we want to discuss. So uh, you want yeah. me to start with the Trump video? Uh, yeah, so we have two videos here we're going to go over today. Um, the bulk of our material, again, is continuing our discussion on the global currency, uh, how it's going to be impacting our U.S. economy. And then also, as always, we kind of just want to touch what the news is covering and what we're seeing uh, I guess what what type of news material is being presented to us more uh, prominently than others. So uh, as we're covering the U.S. economy and the global currencies, we're also going to keep that in the back of our mind. We do have some uh, uh, items in here we're going to use as examples um, and kind of what's going on. And then um, also, as you mentioned, Trump, we have with his interview, uh, he had with Fox News, Tucker Carlson. And then another interview that was recently done was Elon Musk on BBC. So we're just going to dive into those a little bit as well as we get started here. So I, I think uh, we don't have the final on the Trump's uh, mm, no, issue, still, right? So, yeah. But one thing that I was actually looking at uh, yesterday is this is the first time it's happening in the history of US. So this, this never happened before. Now, if they did some crime during the time of their um, uh, term, uh, so then there are different mechanisms to uh, right. follow. Um, but something that was that happened prior, prior. Uh, which is going to create a lot of issues, uh, issues in a way that, um, so this is now going to become the precedence for other presidents. So that means like Biden can be actually um, 
also uh, he can be taken to a court for things that he's doing he was doing before Fire, yeah and now you can call obama you can call others and any future president so this is uh, the complications uh, of this issue is many people again uh, they don't really get into the uh maybe uh, the real things behind the scene the u.s former u.s president still represents this country of course and they have responsibilities uh, and now you're actually making that impossible uh, not only for one person but potentially for other people in the future mm -hmm. now if you kill someone uh, and we didn't you know act timely that's one thing but if mm -hmm. this is something that is just because politically motivated yeah. uh, and then you are trying to go after your uh, competitor that is the danger that we have been uh, talking about but i think this uh, interview that you uh, brought up um, one with the uh, Tucker. Um, so if you see the entire thing, uh, I think we were not really fair to Trump. Um, so, he, well, I mean, maybe you were, but maybe I wasn't, but uh, he's focused on real issues. Yeah, right? so that's, that's kind of the theme we have here. So uh, just to touch on what you mentioned earlier there, um, in terms of, like you're saying, these investigations against uh, prior presidents. So number one, as you're saying, it's politically motivated. And it almost seems like um, with with these trials, those trials going on right now with these 36 uh, felonies you know, that he pled not guilty to, it seemed like the other side was, you know, scraping and doing research to try to formulate something they can use against him. Whereas, you know, if you want to do comparisons, mm -hmm. what you're saying with, uh, you know, we brought, brought up his name prior, but Hunter Biden and all the things that he's done illegally, especially his involvement in Ukraine, which obviously is a current issue now with the war that's going on. You know, why aren't they digging into that and bringing up accusations and, and felonies against him? Yeah. So I think that's the first point. And then second is, yes, as you're saying, um, even as a uh, prior president, they still have responsibility, obviously, uh, in the U.S. best interest. So as you're saying, we do know that he's considering running um, for a future presidency. So number one, that could be why these uh, charges are just coincidentally being brought up now as opposed to years ago, as you're saying, happened even before his presidency initially. But the fact that he does um, kind of have his, his foot in real, quote unquote, real issues that are impacting the U.S. is something to take note of. So when we say real issues, so uh, I think maybe the world was never this close to a nuclear war. Uh, not many people understand this. Right. Uh, we were, uh, you know, the, the closest that we were actually dealing with this issue was uh, North Korea. And no one took North Korea seriously because it's a small, isolated country. Um, for whatever reason, no one cared about them. But now it's a different ball game. Different ball game because now uh, the world actually altogether is in trouble. Mm -hmm. And part of it is um, what's happening in uh, between Ukraine and Russia. Now what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, things are happening now in France. Uh, Taiwan is another really big, uh, yes. huge problem. Now, interesting enough, when we kept um, having these sessions, you and I, we have to do a little bit more reading and research than maybe other people. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these, we have seen them earlier than uh, others because when we brought the Taiwan issue and when Pelosi uh, yeah, insisted uh, going there and creating tension, we are saying that look, this is not, this is not going to go anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to no this, benefit to that. There is no benefit, and now I think that China probably is going to use this, uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, another trouble, big trouble area is going to be um, uh, Taiwan. And actually, in fact, now the French president was in uh, China. And he's saying that just because they have a close relationship with U.S. doesn't mean that they will take uh, U.S. side uh, if there's a yeah if there's a um, conflict. Yeah, I think he was speaking. Uh, Isn't that interesting? Right? Yeah, where he said that Europe should kind of stay in this third party neutral, where they're not going to pick a side necessarily. Which interesting on that because it seems like they're kind of just going to wait for things to play out and then maybe see who has the upper hand before deciding. Because eventually. You're going to have to end up picking a side with one way or another because even in terms of the currency as you're saying on which uh you know universal currency you want to be using when you're conducting all your international trade so uh speaking of visits to china we also have which we'll touch on later but um we know that uh brazil and 
and they're actually their involvement with closing some of those deals and the fact that they're now making visits, uh, their president making visits to uh, China and just this, the idea of, when we're speaking about war, I think most people in their mind, traditionally, you know, they're thinking of guns and weapons, you know, all these missiles, but there also can be a currency war and you can actually like think about the sanctions where you can actually just destroy a country from just a financial aspect. Yeah. Yeah. And you've seen that, you know, think about the countries where the U.S. says, no, like they're going to be on a ban list, like no one can trade with them type thing. So um, to kind of maybe keep the global currency issue from the Trump and the real uh, issues in the U.S., uh, right? So that they're in two different videos. Yeah. Now, um, we have been talking about the world culture um, and it's the, it's actually became the headline now. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. So like, if you look at all the YouTube videos, uh, who's being watched the most? Trash is being watched the most, right? Yeah. If it's trashy, if it's like the gossip, if it's stupid stuff, if we have eggs and other things, and then if I would just, uh, you know, crashing the egg on your head, we would have yeah. 3 million people watching us right now. But if you are providing serious um, uh, news updates, then it's boring for most people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So this is part of the issue today where we are being kept busy with woke uh, culture. Now, mm -hmm. we are being forced um, uh, by the media and by the maybe current administration um, that, well, this is the real issue. Well, this is not the real issue because if you have a nuclear uh, war that's happening next month, two months from now, five months from now, how are we going to prepare and what's our position on that? Or what are we doing to contribute into those conflicts? Are we doing it properly? Are we doing the right thing? Right. So this is where we are actually are not being careful. And that's where I was really impressed with what Trump actually, how Trump did in that interview. He mm -hmm. was so focused and I said, look, there's this is a real issue. Now, you want to go and, uh, you know, support this um, you know, six, four, um, you know, among this uh, man who now has a, uh, wants to compete in the women's uh, swimming um, competition uh, as part of one of the best colleges in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, you know, uh, Deltek or others. It's one of the best in the top 10. You can, it's, mm -hmm. so, like, yeah. and then the pianist with the balls is competing in the girls team and then breaking records. That becomes our main focus mm -hmm. it's not like we don't actually we are extremely sensitive and we are extremely uh, understanding and supporting on the social issues and i personally am and it would be extremely wrong if i say it otherwise but if something is being forced to mm -hmm. say that no regardless of whatever the science says regardless of whatever the um is you know well science uh, whatever science says don't, don't worry about it. So we are going to rewrite the history. We are going to rewrite the science. And now we are going to just talk about it. It's like, why? Mm -hmm. like, why, do we yeah. even not, why do we even now us talk about it? Because everyone else is bringing this up. We are talking about why this shouldn't be happening. Uh, because there's the yeah. real deal. And that real deal is going to hurt us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's maybe part of the issue that we are worried about is this is coming to our way. Now, from the uh, currency and other sides, so we can go there. Uh, yeah. And I do want to come back to the Elon Musk interview, uh, which was uh, extremely good. Uh, but let's let's see uh, this real deal issue of the uh, global currency and what's already what's have uh, what's already happening today. Sure. Yeah. So just to respond to what you're saying there earlier, though, just to wrap up um, the fact that. It seems like the, the media and, like I said, even the current administration possibly is trying to have people preoccupied. And I think ultimately just kind of, in lack of a better word, just using entertained by shoving like these type of issues on what they want you to pay attention to. So just to show um, one of the slides we had there even just showed uh, what percent of the U.S. population identified. Yeah, it's on this video. Yep. Um, showed. Uh, that it was point, so it's four tenths of a percent of the US population identifies as transgender, so it's 1.6 million. And then a comparison on, if you think of the US population of 332 million, and um, what percent of them actually pay their uh, federal income taxes, which I have the graph there, it shows you break down by your uh, income level, but you know, 60% of the people are gonna be impacted by financial news and like say the US uh, 
global currency and the U.S. dollar. So mm-hmm. what is going to be impacting more people? Again, not to be belittling or saying it you know, doesn't matter, but the fact that the news is just seems to be obsessed with, you know, transgender. And now you see the Bud Light example we had where they uh, sponsored um, the transgender. So as a man who went to a woman and the fact that now people are saying, no, I'm not going to drink that beer. I'm just going to make sure I make my point clear. If someone goes through the entire surgery and become whatever it is, and then I, 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 my issue is someone calling someone or being forced to call someone who is a penis, uh, Oh, yeah. um, so, uh, or them competing in. So, mm-hmm. I was talking to one of my friends last night. Um, I said, if I had kids who were competing in sports at school, and if I had like two years who one of them is a runner, the other one is a swimmer, and this happened, mm-hmm. I would have a huge problem. Yeah. Now, if that person, um, yeah, outside of the in their personal life, whatever they do, that's their business, but someone doesn't go through that entire surgery. Just because you take hormones for one year doesn't mean that you, are, right. you may have uh, other uh, issues that you need to deal with, but that's not uh, the taking the hormone mm-hmm. and stopping them, whatever you want. So, I mean, that's that's just uh, yeah. that's not acceptable. And I think okay. I think with what you're saying here to the sports example specifically, that if people were you can like say a feminist for that uh, for that matter, if they're so concerned about women's you know equality and whatnot then they should kind of prevent some of these people who are then men who are now competing in women's sports because in order to protect these women athletes with their actual, you know, right to compete. <laughs> like, I know we saw that video of the guy, there was a UFC fighter, mm-hmm. who was a man, who then I now identified as a woman and literally just knocked this lady out, like broke her jaw in two places. Yeah, like, yeah. super deep voice, like it obviously still has yeah. testosterone and whatnot. So in order to actually protect the women athletes, you know, you have to consider... It was 37 uh, seconds, that fight. Yeah, it, I mean, it was basically I mean, this is, a biological this is, man. See how, yeah. like, this is kind of consuming us mm-hmm. because it makes the headlines. Exactly. And everyone talks about it. Everyone shares in TikTok. I'm like, mm-hmm. people get real. So because like, uh, I know uh, people may or may not uh, understand it's right, but I'm going to try to explain. If like, let's say if you didn't have a car today and if you have enough money to buy a car and if you want to buy a brand new car, Okay. You can get it. Mm-hmm. Average wait time is about 12 months. 12 months. Does it tell you something? Like if you pay something, so I order something and it says, well, it doesn't matter how much uh, you paid and when you paid. Mm-hmm. It's 12 long. months. Yeah. Uh, it can be a little bit longer. So think about it. That's not because they uh are working um and 24 7 and they have everything no they're missing stuff mm-hmm. so supply chain, certain yeah. supply chain is not there so then this is becoming more and more problematic because you order a door and by the way i still don't have doors uh that's january 2022 now it's almost may call it like 16 months uh it doesn't happen. We have these things are going to impact our life more and more every day, mm-hmm. and it's already affecting. Yeah. So, uh, when you have these issues, when uh, and our U.S. currency uh, as global currency, if if it's if you are losing that, if we may lose that, that's going to have other impact in our day to day life. Maybe part of the issue is people uh, when people really don't hear what, I'm, what we are trying to say. Uh, they may say, well, why do you care? Well, it's because when we lose that advantage, that's going to impact our day-to-day, uh, everyday life. So everything is going to become more problematic. Now, one may say on the other side, in, uh, on the other side of the world, they may say, well, yeah, because we are being paying for that. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, that's happening because we make the wrong decisions and we are focusing on the wrong places. So we have a you know, president goes to uh, England and then doesn't recognize the prime minister and it talks to the other person. This just happened yesterday. Mm-hmm. So where is the real focus is, I think, the uh, main issue. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, and the fact that, I mean, as you're saying, it's definitely time sensitive and it's crucial that before, you know, these other countries, like you're saying, we'll talk on, on the BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Um, before they make this shift, you know, it obviously would be a ginormous thing in the global market, obviously. 
uh, it's a shift on what currency is going to be used. But just think about if that does happen, how much more effort would have to go in to then switch that back and then the time it would take. And then while that's all happening, like you're saying, this impact, it will be felt that ripple effect. All of a sudden, like you're saying, supply chain, uh, cost, everything's going up. You said supply and demand. Some examples we had, remember when there's a shortage and even just like, um, you know, eggs, breakfast eggs that people couldn't get that they were normally it's like a dollar for a dozen eggs is up to like six, seven dollars. So just think about those small changes and people don't realize like what they're focused on. Mm-hmm. I want to say it's irrelevant, but it's pretty much irrelevant. Like what's more important? Well, it's not relevant because yeah. if uh, it starts from somewhere and then it's going to just spread. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's the, the once it starts spreading that you can't really control. Yeah. So, okay. um, because all these are warning, uh, the, these are driving on the wall. And if you don't want to pay attention, you don't pay attention. And then, then you're going to hit the wall. Mm-hmm. And so I think they're going to crash on the wall. So that's kind of part of the issue because yeah. they are saying that you, you just said uh, these things may happen, but I'll correct it. It's happening. Yeah. So I was going to uh, call you yesterday for this. Now, all these troubles are happening globally. Uh, the Bitcoin is strong, up, yeah. up a lot from the last year, right? Yeah. So why is because that's a currency by itself. Mm-hmm. An alternative. So others are using it already. So yeah. like when we say, well, is can this happen? Can US uh, dollar lose its global currency status? Can or could? That's uh, not the right question anymore. This is happening, but how fast it could happen and how it's going to impact our day-to-day life is uh, the real question today. It's not like it can or cannot. Mm-hmm. It is happening. Now, this breaks is happening. So it's not like this is a plan for 2050. It and already yet. started. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's why uh, we keep bringing up these issues uh, and we'll, we'll continue doing that. Yeah. Uh, do we want to talk about France a little bit? Yeah. Um, so just to add one more thing on that crypto as we transition to the France and what's going on there. but. As you're saying, uh, some of these countries I looked into where Bitcoin is legal, and it seems to be most of your first world countries, you know, US, Canada, England, but then also important is where it's illegal or banned. And on that list, um, Saudi Arabia and China were the two that said it was 100% banned, like you get in trouble if you're using crypto. So I think it's kind of interesting uh, that Saudi Arabia and China were two of the three on that so list. China is pushing its own uh, currency. Exactly. Uh, so that's what you're saying. That's kind of from that point. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, again, just uh, as a reminder for people to really understand why uh, it's so irrelevant to have this money or a form of money. It was important before 1970 when there was gold reserves mm-hmm. for standard. each dollar is being uh, printed. Mm-hmm. Today, we don't have that. So because we don't have it, the only thing that we have is the um, uh, the confidence of the country that we are giving to the others, okay? Mm-hmm. So stable, uh, the stats or the projection we have. But there is, if you have $10 million today, anymore, go to the banks. That's why those banks actually uh, went down is because they yeah. didn't have the money. Uh-huh. So we don't, like whatever the money we have right now in uh, today's market, uh, only maybe one thirtieth uh, is available, mm-hmm. or maybe one fortieth. Like it's so little so because it's all inflated, it's all artificially exactly. um, produced. So there is no uh, real money. So that's why crypto is definitely gonna go. Uh, and I stayed on crypto just because I was testing this, right? So uh, mm-hmm. I saw uh, crypto going up, which I never got excited about it. But I went uh, like this same balance that I have, uh, we saw $4,000, mm-hmm. right? So that same one now since the Ukraine Russia is at $7,200. Yeah. So that means it's actually getting more powerful. That means people maybe are more and more using More that. people are buying it, yeah. More people are buying that. So, um, and before we finish, uh, and if you guys haven't watched, uh, I don't know if it was on the other video or in this one, but regardless so i'm going to actually turn this video off anyway so um if you haven't watched the uh, elon musk um, interview with bbc i would uh, strongly recommend everyone to see that yes um elon is not a smooth talker um i think he pauses more than i do 
personally. So, uh, but this is more money than you get more airtime. So the issue uh, he's addressing with this BBC uh, reporter is uh, everything that we are discussing today, maybe it's being summarized in that interview. Um, what uh, the real issue is, or what should be the real issue, or who determines um, uh, all these, uh, that's kind of like a really good way of understanding. If you just watch that open mind and uh, just understand what, where he's coming from, it's a very powerful interview. Uh, then, and then it also kind of gives you a real picture of the uh, traditional media. Yeah, so uh, I thought it was great. Yeah, I mean, even when he just asked a simple question back to the, the uh, I was conducting an interview with him, the fact that him coming in with that bias and then once Elon, you know, kind of questioned him on one simple thing, uh, you know, kind of just shut down his whole stance on it. So, like you said, definitely worthwhile. I think even like the the shortened version, maybe just like nine minutes, but kind of just summarizes what we've been talking about. Absolutely. Well, people should make time and then watch the entire thing. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone is that busy. No, nah, you can find nine minutes here. And hope right. So, um, before we start for the bariatric Friday at 3 p.m., Dr. Erdogan is going to join me, but... I have the paper uh, copy of the book. So, um, well, remember I did read this when I put the draft. Mm -hmm. So, um, at least at least three times. So, uh, now it's here. Um, Katie, um, one of our client managers, uh, is so great. <laughs> so she's actually um, she put I believe five or six people together. Yeah. Uh, on April 28th, uh, we are going to do the review of the book. Uh, kind of everyone is going to read it and then we're going to discuss what their take is. And I believe she already has five or six people. Yeah, we already have people, yeah, ordering the books. Yeah, some of them actually already received them. You know, Amazon's like one or two day. One, two, so this seven. is actually, we ordered like 60 for us to mail out for some people. So that's Perfect. that's where I got this from. Yep. So, um, uh, hopefully, everyone can uh, order it. Um, let us know what you think. And I think uh, this is the new culture that we are going to start with. Dr. Joanne Bora, she was the first one who published the book uh, during the pandemic. Uh, then she had the second book. And uh, she's also really great with uh, what she's able to do outside of uh, practicing medicine. And Dr. Bora and, uh, and Dr. Uh, Irga after that. And I've been still working on my book. Hopefully this weekend we'll finish chapter five. So we'll see. All right, well, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week uh, and have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Right.